This past year, I have spent most of my time shipping software outside the corporate world. I have primarily worked on projects as a solo dev or with small teams, and I have been able to dive pretty deeply into many different frameworks and tools. After building many different services and developing my own opinions around which tooling I like the best, I have created a starter kit that helps me build scalable software fast. At a high level, this template provides basic authentication using BetterAuth, payments and subscriptions with Polar SH, Drizzle ORM so you can bring whatever relational database you prefer, and it deploys out of the box to Cloudflare, which can accommodate free hobby projects to serious high volume services. But most importantly, this template implements a project structure that can truly scale with complexity. I like to design software as modular components that can be pieced together. So this template provides a monorepo setup using a PMPM workspace. This allows you to create lightweight packages of reusable code that can be shared across multiple apps. An example of this can be found in a package called DataOps, which contains all the core logic for managing Drizzle schemas, creating database clients, and defining database queries. The queries can then be used in a consumer-facing Tanstack Start app, but can also be used in a separate backend service that handles long-running tasks. Now, if you're interested in getting started with this template, you can do so by running either the CLI command found in the description below, or by forking this GitHub repo. So now let's go through the process of actually getting things set up. Once you have the starter kit created, open up the project in your IDE of choice. You should notice right off the bat that the project structure differs a bit from other templates you've used. In the root directory, the number of files is pretty limited, as this is a monorepo setup that contains multiple apps and packages. We'll go through packages in a minute, but first let's focus on getting the user application up and running. You can get started by running the pmpm run setup command. This will install all the dependencies for all of the packages and the apps. It will then build a package called data ops, which is used by our apps. Once this is done, you can run the dev user application command, which will start up a Tanstack start app. You can rename this app if you like, but the name is intended to showcase that it serves the purpose of being the app that our users will interact with. You'll notice that the UI of this application acts as documentation for setting things up. Once you get your database set up and you build out authentication, you can feel free to delete all the pages and components related to the documentation. This can be done by simply deleting the kit content folder and the files within the static route. Now, before we get our database set up, I find it motivating to deploy the application right off the bat. You can do this by running the deploy user application command from the root of the monorepo. This will deploy the user application to Cloudflare workers, assuming you already have a Cloudflare account. Once the deployment is done, Cloudflare will give you a URL to view your deployment. If you want to change the name associated with your worker, you can do so by changing the name in the wrangler.jsonc file. And yes, you can also use your own domain names associated with your Cloudflare account by adding a route to this file as well. Now that we have the user application deployed, let's get a database set up and configured with your project. One really important thing to note about selecting a database for an application that is deployed on the edge is that you'll want to find a database provider that offers an HTTP proxy for queries that run against said database. The reason being is typically databases can only handle a certain number of concurrent connections. Edge-based compute providers like Cloudflare, Vercel, Netlify, and even AWS Lambda can create a large number of short-lived instances of an application, which has the potential to max out the concurrent database connections. Luckily, we have a lot of viable database providers that offer support for serverless connections. PlanetScale is my personal go-to provider, and they offer a MySQL and Postgres product. But if you are more cost sensitive, Supabase and Neon are Postgres providers that offer a free tier. There are also SQLite options like Terso or even Cloudflare D1 if you want to keep your entire stack within Cloudflare. Regardless of which relational database provider you select, this template should be able to accommodate it. In this demonstration, we're going to be setting up a free Postgres database on Neon. Once your database is created, you can collect the environment variables that are needed to connect to your database. Head over to the data ops package and create a .env file in the root of this package. Paste in the dummy environment variables into your .env file and then head over to Neon to collect your connection string. From here, you can pull out the password, username, and host. Now, let's go find our drizzle config file in the data ops package. This config file will drive most of our schema management workloads. Copy the drizzle config from the docs, then cd into the data ops package. You can now run the command pmpm run pull to ensure everything is configured correctly. The drizzle pull command will read all your public tables in your database and create drizzle schemas that will be used for type safe database queries. You'll notice that the schema.ts file doesn't have any schemas found inside because we have yet to create any tables in our database. So we'll get to this later. The last step in setting up our database is to build out a reusable database initializer and getter. The initializer will take in connection details and will create a drizzle database client. 
Due to the fact that we're going to be deploying to Cloudflare workers, we're going to instantiate the database right after the worker is invoked. Once instantiated, you'll be able to call GitDB wherever you're running server-side code. We'll come back to this pattern in just a minute, but for now, go ahead and build your data ops package, and then head over to the server.ts file in your user application. This is the entry point for all requests when using the Tanstack start framework. Create another .emv file in the root of the user application, and then run pmpm run cf typegen in your terminal after navigating to the user application. You'll notice that a type file is generated, and now you can instantiate the database and pass in the database credentials by using the Cloudflare environment. At this point, you should be able to run the user application with no issues. You can even test your database connection by running a query to select the tables in the database. I'm going to clean up this file, and before we start creating reusable database queries, we can go through the process of setting up authentication. There are a lot of different great auth providers out there, but for TypeScript projects, I really like BetterAuth. BetterAuth is not a managed auth provider like WorkOS or Clerk. BetterAuth is more akin to an auth framework with three core layers. There is the actual authentication layer where you choose how you want to set up sign-on. And with just a few lines of server-side code, your service will be able to handle the entire auth flow for dozens of social providers. You then have the API layer, which will bleed into your server-side business logic. The API layer will tell you information about a session and a signed-in user. You can use this information to build out generic middleware or other server-side logic to manage access control. You then have the client-side layer, which provides hooks so you can manage the sign-in flow, conditionally render based on authentication, and build out your own account UI components. A lot of people think authentication is hard, but I think if you can mentally break auth into these three layers, it becomes much easier. And this is ultimately why I like BetterAuth so much. These three layers of auth are implemented so well, and they have designed a framework in a way where you can extend any layer of authentication with custom plugins. You can build your own custom plugins to solve your own niche problems, but there are also many out-of-the-box plugins like admin features, organization-based data model, and even a clean plugin for handling MCP auth flows. For the purpose of this template, we're going to go through the process of integrating Google Sign-In as it is the social connection that converts the best. In the Google section of the Better Auth Docs, you'll see that it instructs you to create a Google Cloud Console project which can be done for free. It also specifies callbacks that you'll need when you create and configure Google credentials. To get auth set up, we'll get started by copying the dummy environment variables. The better auth secret is used for JWT signing, so I'd recommend using a tool like OpenSSL to generate a secure random code. We can get our Google client credentials by creating client credentials in the Google Cloud Console. Copy the redirect URL for local development from the better auth documentation. You can also add your own domain as an authorized redirect URL. From here, you can collect the client ID and secret and add them to our environment variables. Copy the better auth CLI code into the auth.ts file in the config folder. The BetterAuth CLI will use this file to generate drizzle schemas for your auth tables. The setup for the BetterAuth CLI differs slightly from what you'll find in the BetterAuth docs. I'm planning a deeper dive into BetterAuth, which will explain the BetterAuth setup in this template. But the TLDR is that I have helper functions in the data ops package that will allow you to reuse the BetterAuth client for managing schemas via the BetterAuth CLI and also for using when integrating into your actual service. From there, you can run BetterAuth generate which will generate drizzle schemas for your better auth tables. After the drizzle schemas are generated, you can then run the drizzle generate command. You may encounter an error as the last time I ran this command, it was referencing a dummy schema that I had in the code base. You can fix this issue by deleting the meta folder and also the SQL file. After this, the generate command should work. You can expect to see a new SQL file with the actual table create queries. You can either copy this file and run it in your SQL editor to create the tables, or you can simply run the drizzle migrate command, which will create the tables for you. Now make sure to build the data ops package and head over to your user application. Paste the same environment variables into the .emv file and run CF type gen. In our auth docs, we'll find an example of how to use the set auth method inside of our fetch handler. Go ahead and add that code in the server.ts file. You can then find the dollar sign auth API route and implement the auth handlers. This will be a generic better auth path for all better auth integrations. In the components folder, we already have some React components that use the better auth client to implement the sign on flow and also handles conditional rendering based on a user being signed in or not. Test the authentication by going through the sign-on flow with Google. Right now, it redirects to the home page after being signed in, but you can customize this behavior. Log out and then head over to forward slash app. This path is guarded and can only be accessed if a user is signed in. After going through the sign-on flow again, you'll be redirected to a protected dummy dashboard. So at this point, you have basic auth built out and you can start to customize the flow however you want. On the topic of customization, the UI for this template is based on ShadCN, which means you can customize things however you want. 
I like to use a tool called TweakCN, which has a bunch of pre-built themes you can use, but you can also customize your own themes with this tool as well. If you want to use a theme, you can copy and paste the CSS into your project, or you can run this command and it will be done for you. As you can see, the template theme was updated seamlessly. Now we're going to get into the fun part of building where you actually get to implement your own business logic. I'll showcase the process of building your own custom logic by building out subscriptions with Polar. Before diving deeper into Polar, I just want to call out that I recently launched a course where we build an entire SaaS app on Cloudflare that follows the same project structure. The feedback that I have received from the course so far has been overwhelmingly positive. So if you're interested in a 12-hour step-by-step guide on how to build a SaaS app that runs entirely on Cloudflare, I'd encourage you to sign up for the course. I also want to note that I'll be using this template for future content deep dives. I want to cover topics like advanced payment flows, advanced authentication patterns, TAN stack tutorials, a deep dive into cloud code, building out advanced systems, and more. So if you have content ideas that you would like to see, please let me know in the comments. All right, so now let's build out Polar subscriptions. Polar is a merchant of record, which essentially means you are able to offload regional tax compliance by using Polar. Because merchants of record handle tax compliance on your behalf, they usually have higher fees than Stripe. With that said, Polar actually has lower fees when compared to competing merchants of record. But to me, where Polar really shines is their developer experience. You can tell that Polar was designed for developers by just using their API. You are able to specify your system's user ID when creating customers or managing checkouts. This allows you to avoid the split brain problem where you have to maintain a mapping between your user IDs and customer IDs. They also provide APIs for usage-based billing where you can create meters or a credit system for AI products. I actually enjoyed Polar so much that I moved my course platform from Stripe to Polar. Now I'm going to go through the process of building out subscriptions using Polar, but I'd suggest you watch this section opposed to following along as I'm going to go pretty fast. To get started, I'm going to create a subscriptions table to help us manage user subscriptions. Once this table is created, I'll run drizzle poll in the data ops package. Notice that the subscription schema is now in the schema file. From here, I'm going to create queries to manage subscription data operations. We'll create a query called update subscription, which inserts or updates subscriptions based upon a user ID. We'll also create a query to get subscriptions based on a user ID. Now we're going to build the data ops package and then head over to Polar SH. Creating a Polar account is very easy. Once you have an account created, you can go to a sandboxed account for development. Head over to settings and allow for price changes so users can manage their own subscriptions. And then choose your proration strategy. I have gone ahead and created three test products with various prices. Now let's head over to our user application. You'll find a file called payments in the server functions folder. Tanstack start has the absolute best implementation of server functions I've ever seen. In this file, I've created a base function that takes in two different middleware. The protected function middleware collects the better auth info and throws an error if the user is not signed in. The Polar middleware creates a Polar client that takes an access token, which can be collected from the Polar dashboard. You also need to specify a server. I have sandbox hard-coded, but you'll want to pass this as an environment variable so it can be changed when it's deployed. I'll put the Polar secret in my .env file and run CF type gen. Now notice that we have several exported server functions that are built on top of the base server function. Get products queries the Polar API and lists the non-archive products. Create payment link creates a custom Polar checkout session for a user based on a given product ID. Valid payment checks if a completed checkout is successful. Collect subscription looks for a valid subscription for a given user and saves the subscription if one is found. Together, these server functions will be used in the following flow. The user will select a product and a checkout link will be generated. If the user pays, they will be redirected to a success page and the checkout session will be validated to see if the payment was successful. If the payment is successful, collect subscription will be called and the user subscription will be saved. If for some reason the user subscription is not available behind the API, which I have yet to see happen, we'll also have a webhook that listens for subscription events from Polar and save successful paid subscriptions. In terms of managing subscriptions, Polar provides all the APIs you need to create your own custom experience. But if you're looking to build an MVP fast, you can also generate a portal link for a given customer. This will allow your users to use Polar's UI to manage their subscriptions and account. You just need to make sure you have a webhook configured that fires on subscription events. And then make sure you update the subscription table whenever a webhook is received. Now payments are a very broad topic, and I'd like to do more deep dives if there's interest in that. But before wrapping this video up, I just want to talk about the data service found in this template. I like to start all my projects with two core services, a user application that contains the UI and manages user trigger transactions, and a data service for processing data and managing long running background tasks. Usually the data service contains a queue consumer 
durable objects, and workflows. But you could also build out container-based workflows using Cloudflare containers. A prime example of useful operations that can live in the data service is email management. In my course platform, I move the Polar Webhook receiver over to the data service and it listens for checkout session events. When a user starts a checkout, I receive that data and I store their user ID in a durable object that has an alarm for 20 hours into the future. 20 hours later, the durable object wakes up, checks that the user has made a purchase, and sends a single email using React email and resend. Now before we wrap up, I just want to say that I use this template to start almost all my projects. So I'm planning on maintaining it and adding enhancements as these tools evolve. If there are any niche topics that you'd like me to cover in a future video, please do let me know in the comments. Thanks.